This is a cute little seesaw, a tangible representation of how balance can be achieved by the continual adjustment of two things. Sodium is often pointed out as the culprit behind high blood pressure. Well, sodium has what we propose as a physiological opposite in potassium. And wear it on the street. Get it? I, I left my room for this. I, I hired a cameraman for this intro. Now, the internet are the real streets, and you may have heard that it may not be the full story that sodium exclusively raises our blood pressure, but potassium intake, or the lack thereof, is actually what's behind the full story of chronically high blood pressure. Chronically high blood pressure is what we call a precursor. Pre meaning prior and cursor meaning you're cursed if you get it because it's connected to the most popular disease in the world and cardiovascular disease. We're talking about strokes, we're talking about heart attacks, right? Those myocardial infarctions. Okay, I'll calm down. I guess what I'm asking is, does sodium alone raise blood pressure? And if so, can its opposite molecule in potassium lower it? This video is brought to you by FlexiSpot. Look at this thing here. This is my old desk. Look how wobbly it is. Look at these thin legs. I mean, I hid how terrible my desk was for years. I had it all dressed up, but this is what I was dealing with the whole time. And the worst part is, I was stuck in one position, sitting. I was suffering. My life made a complete 180 when FlexiSpot sent me their easy to put together, sturdy, heavy lifting, ergonomic, stylish E7 Pro standing desk. <laughs> no, seriously, one of the issues I had uh, with my old desk was that I'd get this uh, work from home trap burn from sitting at it for too long. It's because my body didn't always line up comfortably with the height of the desk, but now I can nail it to the decimal point. My arms are perfectly nestled at the right height for any chair that I choose. And I'm talking about if I'm sitting, this baby can stand. If you have a sedentary job, if you suffer from lower back pain, if you are afraid you just don't spend enough time a day on your feet, consider the FlexiSpot E7 Pro standing desk. This thing is an upgrade for life. Look at these thick legs. Its heavy lift feature is assuring. At 440 pounds of weight capacity, you can load this baby up and be confident all of your monitors and expensive equipment will be held up with more care than a baby in her mother's arms. Now, there are a bunch of standing desk companies. I looked it up. But the truth is, the quality that you're getting for the price you're getting it at, it's unbeatable. And they are hooking you up with my code. It's already a Black Friday sale at the time this video was posted, so definitely go look at the website. But with my code, you get another $50 off. With the years taken off our life as a result of wilting away on our butt, uh, take this as an opportunity to literally stand for your health and never go back. Check the link in the description for the E7 Pro standing desk. Thank you FlexiSpot for sponsoring this video and supporting our mission. Welcome to No Lab Code Required. My name is Johnny Cole Dixon. Japan, 1962. The Northeast was under the magnifying glass. Observational researchers noted the folks there had substantially higher rates of death from strokes than the rest of Japan, up to double the rates of the rest of Japan. Researchers zoomed in. They evaluated the lives of those in the Northeast district to see why their rates were so high. They found something fascinating, another discrepancy. The folks of the Amori prefecture had 1.5 times less the rates of those of the Akita prefecture. They weren't looking too good. They found running parallel to the rates of strokes, blood pressures. And of course the researchers went straight to the analysis of salt intake and it turns out both groups were enjoying their share of miso soup and soy sauce, right? A similar amounts of salt intake so what gives? Why are the people of Akita doing so much worse? Researchers proposed the difference was qualified by apple farming? The Amori prefecture, as well as other parts of Japan, are well known for growing apples. And it was these parts that were experiencing the lowest rates. They ran some tests and found signs pointing to the potassium in apple carries. They write, stroke mortality and blood pressure were comparatively low in the apple producing region, suggesting that eating apples containing abundant potassium had something to do with this phenomenon. So is there grounds to this finding? Uh, sure, potassium is the biological opposite of sodium, but what does that have to do with my blood pressure? And if simply adding potassium works, then how? Let's talk about it. Sodium and potassium are rocks. 
they're minerals. I just like zooming out and giving that, that macro view because it really keeps things simple. We get our minerals from the dirt. It just so happens that when we intake these specific minerals, they have a significant influence. One of the influences these minerals have is where water ends up being directed in the body. That is to say that where these minerals go, water follows. And there are two general places to consider. Inside of your cell, we call that intracellular or outside of your cell, we call that extracellular. In this category of extracellular is our blood plasma, the fluid inside of our blood vessels. And that's what we're talking about, isn't it? Blood pressure is about blood vessels. Oh, and it gets so interesting, we're just getting started. Just reach for some soup from the soup shell. You'll soon have your Johnny back here. Did someone say soup? Let's say we pile in sodium all day, eating the saltiest of the saltiest foods. TV dinners, canned soup, cured meats. The proposition is that this sodium will sit in our blood vessels. Why? Because sodium is the extracellular captain. It drives water here. Sodium loading can fill our blood vessels to the point to where we experience swelling in our leg. Okay, now is it really that straightforward? Probably not. But just think about it for a sec. What a powerful influence this mineral has. What does this influence of sodium mean for our blood pressure? All right, let's make this quick, I'm uncomfortable. How would you know the influence of sodium on blood pressure if you don't even know what blood pressure actually is? Blood pressure is the force per unit exerted on a vessel wall. I don't like giving you guys technical definitions, but there really is an important word here, force. As blood flows, it runs up against the inner wall of our blood vessels. That's the force we're talking about. This inner wall is known as the endothelium. Cardiovascular disease involves many things, but scientists theorize chronically high blood pressure or what we call hypertension can initiate injury to that precious endothelium, in which we know endothelial injury is one of the gateway steps inviting CVD. Because of all this, hypertension gets the precursor crown. When you observe a river, the water nearest the bank flows slower than the water making its way down the middle of the stream. And it's because the water nearest the bank experiences the greatest resistance. Let's say the banks of this river moved in closer. What do you think would happen? Well, more and more water would experience that resistance. This is actually the case for our blood vessels. Vascular resistance is tightly involved in determining blood pressure. Vascular resistance is not only dependent upon blood vessel diameter, but very much so the volume of blood. The more blood to pump, the higher the pressure. All right, I got permanent back damage. This idea that sodium just sits and attracts water is actually a well-recognized theory called the water retention theory. It goes as such, more sodium means retention of sodium, which means retention of water, which means more blood volume, which means higher blood pressure. Okay, can you guess where this theory can go wrong? It can go wrong right here. More sodium does not always mean retention of sodium. And this is because of the president of water in the body, the kidney. The kidney is in charge of how much sodium is kept or release in order to maintain homeostasis, right? Physiological balance. I spent $33 on a seesaw. It is how efficient or inefficient the kidney is at keeping this balance that determines if a person's blood pressure is affected or not. So extremely small amounts of sodium or 50 times as much, it doesn't matter. As long as the kidney is functioning normally, blood pressure won't budge. Okay, everything I said is just a theory. I, I wanted to throw that because it's a theory, but it's a well-recognized theory. It's called the Guyton theory, and it's more well-rounded because it includes the kidney, but it too can go wrong. Can you guess where? It's based entirely on if a person's kidney is functioning normally or not. But what happens when someone has a perfectly healthy kidney and still experiences high blood pressure after salt intake? What if we're missing something? Mm. Ooh, excuse me, sorry. Sorry for making bodily noises. Listen, uh, sodium does not have a straightforward relationship. In fact, the scientific literature across the board, for the most part, says that sodium and hypertension is still controversial in terms of the relationship, meaning that it can cause hypertension, it can maintain hypertension, or it could not have any impact at all. And yet, the CDC itself says that it is a straightforward relationship. I really went deep into the nuance of sodium and blood pressure in this this video, you can check that out next after this one. I'll have it linked up in the description. Watch it after. But this video is to answer the question of if potassium intake can actually lower blood pressure. Let's find out. One of the reasons that potassium is known as the biological opposite of sodium is because potassium drives water into the cellular compartment. You see, it's not that sodium has the ultimate unmatched pull on water. Water follows potassium too. The body compartmentalizes minerals, or what we know as electrolytes, 
accordingly. This is how much sodium is concentrated in our blood plasma versus the inside of our cells. And this is how much potassium is concentrated in our blood plasma versus the inside of our cells. You see why the two are opposites? Here are some other electrolytes. You see why potassium and sodium are the biggest deal? One of the most common comments I got on that first salt and blood pressure video was, Johnny, what about the sodium potassium pump? The thing that I learned about in middle school. And I was reading through the comments like, you know what, you guys are right. What about it? I mean, it is the hard worker keeping this balance that we keep talking about, acting like a traffic guard. And, but the sodium potassium pump can't really be bossed around. There's another way more important protein that's way more relevant. And watch out, buckle up. This is what you came here for. This is what you came here for. Yeah, I'll be the judge of that. <clears throat> Whatever that means. I didn't Johnny here. Listen, I just wanted to say, you've made it far into this video. I'd really appreciate it if you show that it's giving you some value by hitting the like button. Thanks in advance. Allow me to introduce you to the thiazide sensitive sodium chloride co-transporter. How about how many who what? Yes, the sodium chloride co-transporter. We'll call him NCC for short. All right, let's, let's not get lost in the sauce here. Lean in, All right, what position are you in? Get up, lean in, lean in. The president of water, the kidney, its most prominent feature is that it filters our blood. Everything we absorb touches the kidneys and it does one of two things with every molecule that passes through. It says, hey, let's keep this in the body, put it back into circulation. Or it says, we can filter this out into filtrate to excrete it as what we know as pee. Ever been on a long road trip and you reach a sign that says, hey, the next exit is until 25 miles from here. It's giving you a warning saying, hey, you can stay on this highway or you can get off now. And the kidney is doing that all day long. It's deciding what's going to remain on the highway, the circulation, the blood, or what's going to be taking the exit. Why does this matter? Well, because it's, it's not based on how the kidney feels, right? Uh, uh, like my generation. It's based on very specific inputs. For example, let's say we went an entire day without salt. In fact, let's say we went the last few days without salt and interest of lowering our blood pressure. What do you think the kidney is going to do? Well, remember NCC? It's in the kidney. And it's the gateway for sodium staying on the highway. That is to say, when NCC is dialed up, sodium is driven back into circulation. When NCC is dialed down, sodium heads towards the exit. Remember, we're in the kidney, so you actually don't have to give it this micro small language. You can just say, hey, this is taking place in the kidney if you ever find yourself explaining this for some reason to your friends. But I point out the NCC because the NCC is actually, when we take in little salt, the NCC is actually what's dialed up. We're saying that when we're trying to get rid of salt, the kidney is actually saying, don't get rid of salt because we need that for blood volume into our blood vessels. Without it, we gonna deflate them and die. So not only does decreasing salt end up retaining salt, but it also barely budges our blood pressure, if at all. So what does the NCC do if we take in a lot of salt, right? What does the kidney do as a response when we take in a lot of salt? I'll tell you, it depends. Depends on what, Johnny? Ask me that, ask me, say it. Depends on what, Johnny? I'm losing my mind. It depends on potassium. If you're low on potassium, there is an activation of NCC even if you already have a lot of salt in your body. Okay, back up, don't get lost in the salt. We'll put it this way. Regardless of the amount of salt in your body, without taking in potassium, you're holding on to that salt. Reason being, uh, the NCC, of course, it's called the sodium chloride co-transporter. So, of course, is in charge of allowing the re-entry of sodium and chloride to remain in the circulation and to stay on that highway. But the NCC also has a downstream effect that ends up keeping potassium in the body as well. Your body is logical. It wants to keep its electrolytes. Your kidneys are logical guys. Comment below, my kidneys are logical guys. Potassium intake, or the lack thereof, may be more important than talking about salt at all. Because the body will fight to keep potassium in the body even at the expense of blood pressure. In other words, it'll happily increase blood pressure if it means it gets to keep potassium. People should be more concerned about the sodium potassium ratio in their diet than the level of sodium or potassium individually. Stated from this study pulled by our Patreon member, Feeling Like a Sir. Feeling Like a Sir also proposed the question. The ratio is important, but continuing to increase potassium as sodium increases will eventually lead to poisoning. At what point do we reach the upper limit? If you're interested in having the research that you find presented or having your questions asked in the next No Lab Code Required video, check out the Patreon link below. So let's answer this question. In healthy people, and by healthy, I mean the scientific term, without disease, 
In healthy people, we actually are taking in potassium faster than the rate at which the kidneys can handle it. Let's say we have sufficient potassium in the body. Well, when potassium comes through the kidney, it's uh, the body's no longer interested in retaining potassium, right? Logically speaking, we have enough. So it actually gets to the kidney and begins to take the turn toward that exit out of the body. Interestingly, and this, this is why potassium and the conversation surrounding it is so important because it, it has this effect that I'm gonna use a slightly incorrect word here that displaces sodium on its way out. In other words, the more potassium we intake, the more sodium is allowed to take that exit out as well. This is at least theoretically, and at most certainly what's behind healthy people not really having a, a tolerable upper limit to potassium. In fact, NASM, who comes up with the tolerable upper limits, weren't only not able to not find that, but they couldn't find a recommended dietary allowance either because the evidence for this stuff is what we call scant. And fun fact, this is actually the case for sodium as well. So instead they give us what we call an adequate intake, which is based on healthy people's intake. So can potassium actually lower blood pressure? Yes, absolutely. And it has less to do with potassium just being the physiological opposite of sodium, but more to do with what adequate potassium communicates to the kidney to not retain sodium. Is that first tank? I had some fascinating stuff pop out at me about potassium while I was doing the investigation for this video. Uh, smooth muscle modification, nervous system impacts. There's more to it, but for now, Go eat an avocado. I hope you guys gained some insight and perspective from this one. I'm gonna get about y'all away.